you for joining us again for another episode of Agent versus Lender. And today we have a local realtor, Brett Charlesworth. And uh, Brett, we're glad to have you on our on our podcast today. Good to be here, Ron. Thank you for inviting me. Awesome. So, um, Brett's uh, um, been in real estate. Um, I, you know, I'm not going to tell his story. I'm going to let him tell us a little bit about him um, and uh, just where he started and a little about him and his team. And, uh, and so I'm going to let you take it away. Tell us a little about yourself, Brett. Okay, sounds good. So, um, so I got into real estate about four years ago. Uh, I was a, uh, in, in business for most of my career, uh, vice president of sales, that sort of thing. Uh, but my sister-in-law had one of the big Keller Williams teams in the state of Utah. And so she recruited me in uh, to kind of uh, break into the Salt Lake area for her. She's, she's more up north into the, uh, the Davis County, Weaver County area. And so, um, so, so I started back then on a team. And I get that question a lot. I, I get the question, well, should I start on a team or should I start solo? And, you know, my experience on the team starting out, I thought was great. Um, I, I think it's a, a good way to start out because, number one, it teaches you the business. It teaches you discipline. And, you know, we had coaches and things like that. So um, we had accountability. Sometimes it's hard to be accountable to yourself when you don't know what you're doing. And we, uh, you know, and, and we had leads, that some leads that were provided to us as well, which, you know, when you are just starting new in the business and you don't have any leads, it's always nice to have some leads. So the trade-off to that is obviously you get up, you give up a lot of your commission, um, you know, when, you, when you're on a team. But, you know, the way I looked at it was, um, what am I going to make at the end of the year? And what kind of experience am I going to get? And uh, so I, I don't regret that at all. And I actually stayed on the team probably longer than I should have. I stayed on the team for three years. But, um, but for that initial year, I was uh, the rookie of the year for our brokerage. Um, I did 42 transactions. Sweet. Um, yeah, yeah, it was a good, a really good year. And, um, you know, my, my, uh, my sophomore year was not quite as good, to be honest with you. I had a little bit of a setback. Uh, but then the third year, I was up to 52 transactions with a lot higher price points and, and pretty much doubled what I made the first year. Um, you know, yeah. you know, when you say um, being on a team, there's, there, you know, you don't make as much. You know, that, that may be true because sometimes you don't make as much per transaction. Yeah. But I know a lot of people when they start out in real estate and they would just want to try and do it on their own. They say, hey, you know, I don't want to give up that, that amount. But the problem mm -hmm. is, is, you know, we have a coach and they say, you know, I'd, I'd rather have a, a, you know, a slice of a watermelon than a whole grape. And, yeah. and you know, it's the same, it's the same, same thing right there. It's just like, you know, when you're, um, when you are on a team and you're getting the accountability, which is huge. I mean, accountability is so key to making it in this business and, and some coaching. It's just like, it's, it's so worth, it is so worth the amount that you're giving up, especially for the first um, two, three, four years um, that, that are critical years to, to, to learn this business. Yeah, I, I absolutely. I would agree. I, I just feel like, I thought that analogy you gave was great because, you know, I have friends that started in the business about the same time I did and tried to go it on their own. And yeah, they, they got a higher percentage per transaction, but excuse me, they ended up with, you know, five or 10 transactions at the end of their first year. And I had 42. Well, you who made more money, you know? Right. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So, um, so yeah, that, I mean, I, and I, I think that that's a great takeaway is maybe go starting out with that team just gives you access to those resources that a big team typically has. So like coaches, you have, you know, more accountability, you might have some more, you know, software or, you know, team members that you can help rely on. So um, maybe being able to do that to kind of learn the business is, is a good route. So since then, I think you've kind of transitioned to doing your own thing. So uh, what made you make that transition? Yeah, so uh, I just felt like it was time, time to go out on my own. I was starting to, 
you know, that first year, most of the leads that were generated were generated by the team and not me. And, um, you know, and, and as time passed, I started generating most of my own leads. And so at that point, um, I felt like, well, I now should be getting a bigger percentage of these transactions. Um, I also was, you know, eventually became the, uh, the director of sales for that team. And I was training new agents and recruiting new agents and stuff like that. And to be honest with you, I really wasn't enjoying it. I mean, that's what I did my whole career was, was uh, management. And I really um, just am enjoy, <clears throat> enjoying just kind of doing my own thing and not being responsible for a bunch of other people. So, um, so I, I broke away. And uh, that transition was, you know, I mean, it's always a little scary, right, to do that. It's, it's yeah. always the... Fear yeah. of the unknown, right? Yeah, yeah, I've done that too. I've, you know, I've I started out obviously on um, working for other people, and you know, it is it's a big leap when you jump. Even if you're not like starting your own brokerage, even just jumping away from a team, it's a big leap of, leap of faith. But uh, but it sounds like you've done really well. It sounds like it's been been a good move for you. Yeah, it's been a really good move. I, I think so. One of the one of the motiv uh, one of my motivations as well was I wanted to really increase my price point, even though my price point had gone up throughout the years. So I chose a, a you know more of a luxury brokerage, and um, and focused. You know what I've done this year is focused on that higher price point, and it's really paid off. You know what you focus on expands, as we we've, we've all heard, and uh, and and that was definitely true. Uh, in that case. And so my transactions, I don't think I'll, I'll end up at the end of this year with as many transactions as I did last year. <clears throat> I'll probably be, I would guess, maybe about 10 off from last year. But the price point of those transactions, you know, it's a couple hundred thousand more on average. So it's um, quite a bit different in terms of income for sure. Yeah. So what are some of the things, you know, talking about focusing on kind of that luxury side of it, what are some of the things that you do differently focusing on that? Is there, you know, something that you do to attract that business or, um, you know, without giving away your trade secrets, but maybe. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, well, work. yeah. So I think first of all, just the brokerage I chose is known for luxury. So that helps for sure. Um, and then, you know, if, for example, I don't do like a ton of um, expired listing, FISBO type stuff, but I do a little bit of that. And if I'm going to do it, I just choose higher priced homes to go after. I don't, I don't go after, you know, $250,000 homes or $300,000 homes. So I choose that higher priced home to go after. Um, but then, you know, in terms of marketing to a farm, uh, you know, I started doing that when I broke out on my own. Uh, so marketing to a farm, my SOI, et cetera, et cetera. Um, you know, I'm going after that, that higher price point. And then the services that I offer, you know, I'll do a, 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 a really nice video. All of that's done in-house at the company I'm with. I don't know if I'm supposed to mention companies, so I'm not doing it. But if it's okay, I don't care. So who, yeah, who are you yeah. with? Yeah, I'm with Sotheby's. So I went from Keller Williams to Sotheby's. Cool. And um, the, the reason why I chose them is because um, – they, number one, just their reputation, but number two, they have everything in house. So going from a team rather than me having to hire a photographer, a videographer, um, you know, all those different things, marketing department, somebody to create for me, that's all done in house. And so I just felt like I could focus on real estate instead of trying to focus on all that stuff. Yeah. And it's, you know, it's really been beneficial. I, you know, I pay, I'm sure a higher split than others pay and things like that, but I feel like it's worth it because it's, um, you know, it's, it's taking a lot off of my plate, so to speak. And the yeah. quality is phenomenal. So, so if I go into a listing presentation, I'm, you know, and I have to pay for it, but I'll, I'll create a nice, you know, 90 second video for them of the house. Um, you know, if, if it's a higher end house, I'll do twilight pictures, uh, drone shots, you know, and just, I just, the quality of what we do is just really, really high. And so that's what I offer. You know, th there, there's something to be said for doing what you do best. Um, 
I know, you know, so I'm going to, I'm going to jump back over to the lending side. I know that there, there are some brokers that I know that try to do it all. They, they will, they will, uh, uh, they will do the marketing. They will originate. They will, um, they will uh, put everything into the system and they will try and uh, they'll try and process it. You know, there are one man, one man show or, or one girl show, whatever it is. And, um, and they do a lot to try to get their several deals done. So when you get to, you know, you start getting to the next level and you start getting busier, there's just no way you find, you find that if you're a restaurant and you find that restaurants have hosts and they have, um, they have cooks and they have waitresses and they have, you know, they have all these different things and they have people to, to, to clean after up at them. So uh, after, after them. So if you try to do it all, you just can't do anything really, really well. And so that's kind of the way we've set up here too. It's just like, you know, Taylor has his specific um, area in which he runs the business. Actually, Taylor runs, actually runs most of the business. And I go out and I, I, I'm trying to bring in the leads. And we have, we have some assistants and we have a processor and we, we have people that specialize in their area. So we're, you know, we're, we're closing, I don't know, seven, eight million this month. Um, and at your price point, that's, that's, that's probably not as, as big of a deal, but you know, our price point's 275. So we're closing, you know, close to 30 loans this month. And yeah. there's no way we can do that without a team behind us, but we do that without, without sacrificing, um, the, the service and, and stuff that you are mentioning. So good for you for recognizing that there are certain things that's just worth paying for so that you can go out and getting business. So that's, so anybody listening to this right now, take a, take a page from Brett's uh, business model and pay for those services it, because you know, you can, it's my, my coach calls it, you know, you have $10 activities, you have $50 activities, you have hundred dollar activities and, and, and so forth that you don't want to spend your time doing 10, 10 and $20 activities. You need to hire that stuff out. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So that, that, that was part of why I, I chose this brokerage is because, um, you know, they have a lot of employees that, that, that do all that creative for you and so on and so forth, transaction coordinators, et cetera. So it's all just kind of, it's, it's, it's a little bit like being on a team, but not, not quite like being on a team, <laughs> if that makes sense. <laughs> yeah, you're still able to focus, you know, because before when, when you're on the team, being like the director of sales and you end up having to kind of fill some other roles besides being a real estate agent, you know. Yes, Whereas, yeah. You, know, you can be a real estate agent and you have maybe some people that help make it easier to be a real estate agent. So you're still focusing on on that so correct so question you said that you had um you had some accountability and coaching when you're on that team but you're not on that team now so how do you mm -hmm. keep yourself accountable when you made that shift and you made that jump from a, a team to basically being the guy how do you how do you do that how do you keep yourself accountable yeah, and that's that's always a, a good question, you know, should I have a coach, um, so on and so forth. I'm kind of a rare breed in that I'm very self-motivated and self-disciplined. Um, and not that, like, I believe in coaching for sure. Like, I'm sure I'll have coaches throughout my, my time in the future as well. Um, but right now I don't have a coach. And um, I'm just the type of person that wakes up at 5, 5, 530 every morning works out. You know, I have a morning routine. I'm in the office by eight, you know, I'm on the phones. And so it's just, I, I have that self-discipline. Um, I would say 90% of the people don't have that self-discipline and believe me, I'm not perfect for sure. I mean, it's easy to, to get off track and it's easy to fall, you know, away from your plan and your schedule. And I do it all the time because I'm human, right? So anybody that tells you they stick 100% to it, I mean, that's great in theory. But, um, but if you can make a huge attempt to stick to a disciplined schedule, um, you know, it'll make all the difference in the world. Yeah. 
Yeah, absolutely. And, it, you know, something that kind of came up to me while you were saying that, because I think that Ron and I are pretty self-motivated people too, but I know that we've, we've both kind of hit some times where we plateau a little bit and it's like, <laughs> you know, you're going, you're going, and then, you know, something happens, you know, maybe even in your personal life that kind of makes it so you plateau a little bit. And so, you know, for the people that are, that are listening, um, yeah, we, we, we always kind of recommend having a coach or having even, even doing something, listening to, you know, Brett and what, what he's saying to help keep that motivation going and help, you know, prevent from that plateauing. So hopefully people out there listening or, you know, they're trying to do that self-improvement and um, taking, like Ron said, a page from your book to, to see if they can incorporate something to, to be a little more motivated and, and generate that business. Yeah. I, I loved what you said about the, um, about being the, the routine in your schedule and having that schedule, I think is just vital. Um, because if you know what you're going to do for the next day, it makes it so much easier to move forward. Otherwise you're just reacting to whatever comes up and you're not, yeah. not, you're, you're not being intentional in your business. You're, you're just being reactive instead. And it makes a huge difference in being able to grow. And yeah. even if you have to be reactive. You're probably a lot more prepared for that when you're sticking to that schedule as well. Yeah. And I think, I think if you, um, it, it seems like, uh, you know, if you get into the office at 10 or 11 or something like that and start your work day, I mean, I'm pretty much done with the disciplines part of my schedule by, by 11 o'clock. And so then now it is time to go out and do showings and, you know, things of that nature, right? Work on contracts. And so not that it never gets interrupted. I mean, sometimes it does. Let's just be real. But, but for the most part, um, you know, other people aren't really demanding stuff before 11 o'clock if that makes sense. <laughs> so, yeah. so if you can get your stuff out of the way by 11 o'clock, then, then, you know, then you can move on to that stuff um, later in the day. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm, I'm curious, <clears throat> you had moved, once you moved from the team to, to, to another brokerage that focused on luxury, that's another leap. How did you do that? I think, I think, you know, I, I'm cur I would like to know, and I, I'm sure other people are, are the same way. They would like to know, how do you make that leap from, you know, the two, three, four hundred thousand dollar houses to more of a luxury home? Well, and, and I, I don't want to give the wrong impression either, because I'll, I'll still, I'll still sell a, a one hundred thousand dollar condo if somebody wants to list it with me, right? So in fact, I've, I've sold two of those this year, <laughs> you know, so literally two different, you know, $110,000 condos in Ogden. So, um, so, you know, I, I, I'll take, you know, I will take anything for sure. And, you know, I'll do a great job for you. I'll do the same job for you if it's a hundred thousand dollars or if it's a million dollars and I'm still breaking into there, but, um, but yeah, so I, I think just kind of going back to, um, number one, the choice. So I lived in a neighborhood in, in Draper, Utah, that was a pretty exclusive neighborhood. So, you know, in my previous life, you know, I did okay for myself and whatever. And, and so I lived in a pretty exclusive neighborhood. And um, when I was on the team, I actually had an assistant. And I was driving around that neighborhood with this assistant um, last year. And I'm just like, what the heck? I have no listings in this neighborhood. I've never had a listing here. And, um, and I've still never had a listing there, <laughs> but well, that's okay. So, so anyway, but, but, but at that point, I just made this vote, this, this conscious, um, you know, decision that I need to, to focus more on that, on that higher price point. And so, although I haven't had necessarily a listing in that neighborhood, I've been able to gain a lot of listings in a lot of other neighborhoods that are in that higher price point. And, um, and so, uh, you know, again, I just think it's a conscious decision. I align myself with a brokerage that I thought could really help me accomplish that um, just, just by the name and what they offer. And, um, and then I focused on it. And so I don't know, I mean, maybe that's not very detailed, but you know, that's, that's what I did. And so I was intentional about calling people 
that had um, higher priced homes instead of calling people with, you know, necessarily lower priced homes. So as an example, when I was on the team, um, you know, a lot of, they, they did a lot of advertising for leads in places like Zillow and places like that. And I found that the majority of the leads that I got from the team were first time home buyers. Right. 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 Yep. And, um, and those first time home buyers typically aren't buying a $700,000 home. True. <laughs> right. And so I, I remember it, it seems like it was like four or five days in a row. I would go down to Orem and meet because when you get a Zillow lead, they want you to meet the client. You know, they don't want you to really pre-qualify them. They want you to just meet them. And so I'd go meet a client and there was, it was usually a student who was not pre-qualified <laughs> who wanted to see a condo. And I'm like, you know, so here's, you know, so I'm driving from, you know, whatever Draper to, to Orem, which isn't a bad drive, but you know, just time after time. And, and I, I found that, you know, that wasn't really, what I wanted to be doing. And so even though I'm happy to, to do it, I'm happy to help, like I say, any price point. But it's interesting, I got a call from an agent on my former team a couple days ago, and they were calling on a listing that I had canceled. You know, the owner had changed their mind, the seller had changed their mind and decided not to sell. And they were wondering, because this market is so competitive, they were wondering if I was, you know, if I could talk to that seller and get them to sell. You know, it was like a two hundred thousand dollar townhouse, and I asked her how, you know, like like how business was going, and she said she has, you know, six or seven buyers that are all in that price range, and of course, in this market, she's just pulling her hair out right. because it's so competitive, and she's going through. I mean, pr I'm proud of her. I mean, to go through that kind of effort, to go through canceled listings to try to get her buyer a a, a house is is extraordinary. You know, most agents aren't going to do that for their buyers, but um, that's that's a lot of effort, and um, that's just not where I want to put my focus right now. Yeah, yeah. So just and just to be clear, I know Brett said this a couple of times, but anybody listening that's you know thinking about using him, um, don't don't feel like oh you know I'm looking in the two hundred price range, I can't use him. Just know that you're going to get, you know, that luxury service with, with Brett, regardless of that, you know, price range that you're in. So, um, yeah, don't, don't feel discouraged <laughs> by prices or anything like that. But so just a little. Exactly. Yeah. I do find it interesting, though, that what you said, you said you were intentional about making phone calls and doing your marketing to um you know just a different just a different subset of the market and so it's not it, you didn't fall into that you were intentional with that so i just found yeah. that very interesting that you know and and actually eye opening so people that that um you know if you are if you are um advertising uh, uh grants and no down payment programs you're going to be getting the first time buyers and um that's probably not what you're advertising no. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. It's, um, I'm definitely, like you said, I'm intentional about focusing my marketing on, you know, on a higher end home. So, and again, those aren't, you know, it's funny because agents are probably like, yeah, you don't have to sell very many of those. And believe me, a lot of our agents are up in park city and they don't have to sell a lot of those, you know, $4 million or $5 million homes, which is not my price point, but, um, but they're sure selling a lot of them right now, by the way. <laughs> Park City's going crazy. Uh, yeah. but, uh, <laughs> it's, uh, it, it really is. But, but just for agents out there, I mean, the higher price points, um, you know, they're actually more difficult. You know, the customers are, are more demanding. Um, you know, they don't sell as, as quickly. I mean, you know, there's, there's, it's not all, <laughs> you know, like you've got to be in that price point because some people won't be comfortable there. I was comfortable there because I, you know, I lived in a neighborhood like that. I still do. You know, I mean, I moved from that neighborhood into another neighborhood, but I'm not uncomfortable with, you know, people that live in million dollar houses. I mean, that's just people that I associate with anyway. Yeah. And so some, some people are intimidated and uncomfortable. And if that's the case, then that's probably not what you want to do. Yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah, and even, you know, I, I think for a lot of agents who are just starting out, um, you know, it's, it's good to say, you know, I'd like to kind of focus on that. But I, I think for most agents starting out, it's like you just take whatever comes to you and you're, you know, hungry for those leads. <laughs> and um, to be honest, there's a lot more leads at that first time home buyer um, phase than there is later on because most of the time when people are buying those, those types of houses, they're using, you know, the same agent that they've used the past three times. They're using the same lender or banker or whoever it is. And so they get a little bit more set. So it's kind of hard to break into that. Um, Mm -hmm. I think that you've given us, you know, some, some good advice on being proactive and that's a good way to gain some of that market share. Um, but you you know, there, and sorry, Taylor, and there's nothing wrong with first time home buyers, quite honest. No, 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 of course not. Them at all. We, we do a lot of those. So yeah. nothing wrong yeah. with that market. Just, just to be clear. So go ahead, Taylor. Yeah. <laughs> all right. <Yeah. laughs> um, That's funny. So, I mean, how are you seeing that as far as, you know, ongoing referrals? Where's your business coming from? Is it, is a lot of it referral based or are you? Um, yeah. yeah. So, you know, it's funny because my, my, my whole career, you know, like after I was the rookie of the year, you know, new agents would always want to find out, what are you doing? Where's your business coming from? And, um, you know, I, I like to have 10 to 12 lead sources. I really do. And, you know, I'm not, you know, I'm not above knocking on doors. I'm not above doing open houses. I'm not because that's what gets you business. You know what I'm saying? And so I'm not above driving. Like some agents will only work a specific area. And believe me, that would be great if I could just stick in one city and make a lot of money. But, um, but I've had to go all along the Wasatch Front. I grew up in Ogden, so I have a lot of business up there. And I live in Sandy, so I have a lot of business down here. And I've done a lot of business in Utah County. So I'll drive, you know. <laughs> um, I'm not you know, I'm not above doing that. But um, just so for example, this year, uh, I've, I've closed five transactions from open houses. Wow, good for you. Yeah, that's great. And, and if you think about the open houses were pretty much shut down for two months this year. Yeah. Yep. That makes it even more remarkable, right? It does, totally. And so, you know, I'm not like some agents might get to a point where they you know, oh, I'm only going to take referrals or whatever. And that is the biggest part of my business this year. As I, as I broke it down, um, you know, I have received more leads from referrals than any other source, but, um, you know, five closings from, from open houses, that's, you know, that's a great source. And, um, you know, new agents can do that. They can ask to, to do, even if they have no listings, they can ask to do open houses for, for other people in their office, things, things of that nature. But I just really feel like, um, like the key to, to my success in real estate has been listings, has been listing focused. Yeah. Because when you're listing focused, the buyers come from that. Yep. You know, um, whether it be open houses, door knocks, sign calls, whatever it may be, everything's generated because you have listings. If you don't have any listings, if you're average, you know, maybe your SOI will call you in terms of a buyer. But other than that, it's, it's pretty hard to get buyers if you don't have any listings. If you have listings, the buyers come to you. Yeah. Yeah. So being really proactive at those open houses, you're not there to show the house. You're there to gain clients really is what it is. Yeah. I mean, of course, you know, I'd love to sell the listing. Right. And I have sold listings at open houses. A lot of agents will tell you, yeah, open houses are a waste of time. And, you know, people just do that to get leads. And yeah, I mean, that's, that's the main focus, but I'm also focused on selling my listing, you know, um, which, you know, does happen uh, from time to time at open houses, but yeah, you're exactly right. Um, You know, open houses, that's a storefront. That's a good, good place to meet people. It's kind of weird with face masks on now, you know, to, (laughs) <laughs> get to know and meet people but um but but it's you know it's a great way to meet people and gain their trust and um you know and then of course it requires follow up you're not you're not probably going to to sign them on as a client right there at the open house 
you know, you're going to follow up with them and you're going to have discipline to, to continue to follow up with those people um, until they do gain, gain your trust and want to use you as their agent. And so it's just a, it's just a system and it's perseverance, discipline, and not being too, I guess, too good to do certain things in the business. I'm not really, I, I don't believe I'm too good to do anything. You know, I'll knock on doors, I'll do open houses, um, I'll make uh, phone calls, you know, whatever it is that, that you need to do to be successful, that's what you need to do. Yeah. And so for those, I guess, listening to this, um, you know, and Brett, correct me if I'm wrong here, but I think that the difference is that you're willing to do anything, but when you're doing those activities, you're analyzing, okay, is this, is this actually bringing in, you know, money? Is this going to be productive for me to do? And so it's not just, you know, don't, don't be busy, be, you know, proactive and be, you know, ready to do that stuff. On that same note, I do have a question um, and you might not have the answer here, but um, on average, how many phone calls are you making a day to, uh, you know, prospective clients or past clients? Yeah. So I make about, my goal is to make a hundred calls a week, 20 calls a day. I usually don't call on Saturdays. Okay. That's awesome. So, the, so and you feel like you're pretty consistent at that? Yeah. So I track it. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. How, how do you normally track that? Just on you know, a piece of paper doing check marks or? <laughs> so that's, yeah, that's funny. Well, today or you know what? That's that's a system. Yeah. And if somebody yeah. doesn't have a system, it's just like get a piece of paper out and write it down. That's like that's just yeah. the that's yeah. great system to at least to start with. Yeah. So currently, um, yeah, I mean, I do that on a daily basis. I just make a, a tick mark and then I'll and then I'll uh, enter it into a spreadsheet. Um, I used to. <laughs> I need to give my brother's company a a, a, a plug. <laughs> so I used to use a. Uh, I used to use a, uh, uh, an app called Sisu and Sisu it's, it's pretty expensive for just an individual agent like myself, but for a team, it's really awesome because you can track all those calls and track all your teammates and all that sort of thing. So anyway, that's his app. It's called S I S U. And that's what, that's what I used for a couple of years. And I really miss it because it's a lot better than that spreadsheet, but, um, I couldn't justify the cost with, with just me as a solo agent. <laughs> You asked for a family discount or anything? No, he, no, he didn't give me anything. So, you know. <laughs> That's cool. So, yeah, maybe people, maybe brokers or something that are looking for, you know, a good system like that. That might be a good place to look. Yeah, I actually wrote uh, yeah, it down. I want to take a look yeah, at it. Yeah, we're going to go take a look at it. <laughs> so, yeah, it's, it, it's yeah. actually really awesome. When I was the director of sales for, for the team, I mean, you could just at any time look at the stats of your, of your team. Um, just right there at your fingertips. So um, very, very useful tool, tool. And of course, you know, if you are, I mean, you just need to keep, you need to uh, keep track of whatever you're doing. You need to keep track of your calls, your, um, you know, your active clients, your hot leads, um, your under contracts, your, I mean, everything needs to be, um, be followed. And I do have a spreadsheet, but I also currently, so I used to use Boomtown as my CRM when I was on a team. And again, it's pretty cost prohibitive for an individual agent to use that. Uh, but currently I use a, a software pack or a, an app called Close. Um, and it's spelled C-L-O-Z-E instead of S-E. And um, it's actually got this cool feature where it just gives you this snapshot. So if you remember the old, um, say, whiteboards, you know, if you were keeping track of, you know, okay, these are my my uh, hot leads and these are my under contracts and these are my closed and whatever. Um, it actually gives you a one screen view of that whole thing, um, you know, at any time. And so you can kind of just, just look at that, uh, you know, at the beginning of your day. And of course you can put set to do's and have callbacks and all that sort of thing as well, so that you know what you're doing every day. But, um, but it also gives you kind of that, that big view, which Boomtown didn't give me. I really like that about clothes, but it's pretty inexpensive. I think it's like 35 bucks a month. Yeah, that's cool. Yeah. 
And I know that there's, you know, one that we've used too is like <clears throat> Trello, which is kind of that, um, you know, whiteboard type thing. You have cards, you can move them to different places. And I think mm -hmm. you can start that one for free. So if, you know, it's a system that you're looking for, first off, don't wait for the perfect system to start tracking your stuff um, because there's no perfect system out there. Each one has its pros and cons. Um, so just start tracking, even if it's on paper. But then the next is you can, I mean, nowadays you can find almost anything that you're looking for for free, um, but then, you know, it's going to probably have maybe more cons than if you're paying for it. Um, so I guess using that technology to, to help is, I mean, it, it can really be a game changer for people. So the game changer isn't necessarily using an app. The game changer is tracking. Yep. That's yes. a game changer. Yep. Mm -hmm. And if you don't track, you can't grow because you don't, if you don't know where you've been, you don't know how to get better. Yep. So, and, and, and along with that tracking, you've got to have goals. So like if you want to have 10 appointments a month, you got to have that as a goal and you got to track that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, so I have just in my little spreadsheet, I just have a weekly, you know, whatever, two, two appointments a month or a week sort of thing, you know, and, and then where am I tracking on that and how many are listings and how many are buyers and, and how many agreements have I signed and what's my goal on agreements and what's my goal on closings and what's my goal. And so if you don't, if you don't have like kind of a game plan going into each month. And so every month I just set up a new game plan. This is what I want to accomplish this month. And, um, and then I track it. And at the end of the month, I can see, did I accomplish it or did I not? Now, the one thing is obviously closings, unless you're going to get a cash buyer under contract, you weren't expecting that's pretty much going to be determined the month before. Right. <laughs> so, right. yeah. Yeah, I mean, you've even broken it down. It sounds like to even what are the phone calls that need to be made to be able to get these appointments to be able to, you know, and so he's, and, and you can adjust that. So if, you know, if you want to increase your, your salary, then, you know, well, maybe I should, you know, make 150 calls a week and, you know, try and get three appointments. You know, you can kind of, in this industry, you can really kind of help to, I mean, do that balance of, all right, I know that it's going to be more work, but maybe I'm willing to do a little bit more work for this or, or whatever. So, um, yeah, I, I think that that, but if you, if you don't track anything, you're going to be busy, especially right now, you're going to be really busy, but you might be busy putting a lot of miles on your car and not getting, <laughs> not getting to the closing table. Right. You know? So yeah. 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 Miles don't necessarily equal dollars. <laughs> no, no. Yeah, I do. I do a lot of those for sure. Yeah, okay. busy is good, but productive is better. Yeah. So. Yeah. Man, I'll tell you that we could we could turn this into multiple yeah, how episodes. Many more hours do you have? Yeah, right? I know. <laughs> no this is this is awesome. Yeah. Um, we are getting pretty close to our time, um, so we are going to wrap this up. Is there any word of wisdom? Is there any like um, something that if you had to start over that maybe you would do differently? Well, so I'm going to, I'm going to answer your question, but not answer it. So, so kind of my, my word of wisdom is um, in this business, it's very easy to get discouraged. Um, even if you're doing 40 or 50 transactions a year, it's easy to get discouraged because what will happen is those will come in cycles. They won't be consistent, you know, five a month or whatever, right? 10 a month, you know, it's not going to happen that way. It's going to come in cycles. And, and I just think, um, you know, easier said than done because I, I think we all can get discouraged, but just keep your, keep your head up and just keep working and working smartly and, and doing those things you're supposed to be doing and, and it will happen. So um, when you're going through one of those cycles, just, just keep working and um, you know, it's eventually going to happen. Don't give up on it because a lot of, a lot of realtors just give up, you know, it's, it's easy to give up. So. Yeah. And I, I think to add to that, you know, if you're, if you have the same mentality as, as Brett and you're trying to be, you know, really motivated, proactive, and, you know, you might have a slow month, but that probably means that you're spending more time on, on the phones and, and that's going to 
you know, buckle up because the wave is coming sort of thing. And so, um, yeah, I think that, I think that, you know, if, if you're looking for someone to, uh, or try, try and find someone like, like Brett, you know, if, if you're getting into the business and, and just take him to lunch and kind of pick his brain a little bit, do something like that. Um, you know, assuming he's got time or whoever else has time, but I think finding that mentor, um, yeah, it's a, it's a big move when you're starting out and it'll help with some of that discouragement that, that could come. So, yeah. so thank you so much, Brett, for being on with us. How do people get in touch with you? What's the best way? Yeah, really uh, just call me at 801-557-7406. Or um, you can email me at Brett, that's just with one T, B-R-E-T. It's a really long email address, but it's Brett at charlesworthrealestate.com. So first name at charlesworth, my last name, realestate.com. Awesome. All right. So yeah, thanks for, thanks for being on with us. And yeah, we thanks appreciate so much. it. And man, yeah, we might have to do this again. I think that we just barely scratched the surface on you know, the <laughs> know. wealth of knowledge that you have and advice that you can give. So I appreciate that. Thanks for having me. Awesome. Yeah. So you can get hold of us at hold of uh, Taylor or I um, at 801-628-7667. And that will wrap up another episode of Agent Versus Lender. And we'll see you next week. <laughs>